You're watching Democratically Speaking. My name is Mark Lindy, and I'm your host, and I'm also the chair of the Brockton Democratic City Committee. I'm here with Gary Keith. Gary, welcome. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you. Nice to be here. Um, second time around for Gary Keith for, uh, for Councilor at Large. Yes, uh, it is. You also drew number 10. Yes, I did. Again. <laughs> okay. Um, tell us about Gary Keith. Okay. Uh, tell us about your story mm -hmm. and why you're running. Well, I'm running basically because uh, I feel it was basically I woke up out of my sleep one morning and uh, from a dream I told my wife, I said, you know, I said, I just had a dream where the Lord spoke to me. I said to actually send me forward to help save the city of Brockton. And I decided to jump into the race, you know, start to get to learn what's going on in the city. And uh, two days later, um, Petty and uh, Councilman Petty and Brophy both retired. And I was like, okay, Lord, that's a sign. Mm -hmm. And um, so I jumped into the race, met a lot of great people, you know, and um, it was fun running, it was hard, made a lot of mistakes, but did a lot of things right. And um, even though I lost in the primary, I must have did a pretty good job because the mayor and the council board actually um, appointed and approved me for the uh, planning board. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, I sit on the zoning board also. Um, but to tell you a little bit about myself, I've been married for 29 years to my wife, Kathy. We have seven kids here in the city of Brockton. Um, my daughter, Cherie, Gary Jr., 29, um, Vanden, Cameron, Christian, Darian, and Desiree. Darian actually just got dropped off to college with a full scholarship to American International College after playing football in Brockton High last year. Um, We've been in the city of Brockton for over 25 years, and um, I have an extensive law, uh, background in law enforcement. Also, um, like I said, I sit on the planning board and the zoning board, and um, I used to be the chairperson for the South, uh, South Shore Head Start, uh, Self Help Head Start of, of Massachusetts. I held two positions there for the state and mm -hmm. for uh, this region. Um, former owner of Bostonian Security Corporation. And uh, former foster parent, my wife and I, we used to, we raised a lot of uh, foster children. And um, we're t over 20 year members of our church, Jubilee Church, right there in, on the Stoughton Brockton line. Mm -hmm. so. so what, I, I, I heard what got you into the race to begin with the first time. Mm -hmm. What's, is there anything different this time? No, you know, the, the first time, I was a little bit disappointed when I lost, okay. Um, because my heart was in it, I, you know, all my passion was in it, and it was, it was hard, uh, very tired afterwards. But nothing has changed. I still feel that I can make a difference in the city. I feel that um, one of my strong points is working with people and bringing them together to, for a common goal. I think that uh, we're still lacking some things in our city council at, uh, chambers, and that means the cohesiveness of the council itself, to where um, I'm not saying that we all go one way, but let's get along, let's work together. And I think we need someone who can actually negotiate between all parties to actually uh, move the city forward, you know? Now so. we were talking in the break in between my two interviews so far today. Um, I got about four more to do afterwards, but mm -hmm. um, you took a pretty dramatic stand as a candidate for counselor at large mm -hmm. to back the current mayor. Yes, I did. Tell, tell me why you <clears throat> did that, because that is a risk. It is a risk. One thing, it separates me from uh, the other city councilors as far as going out and taking that risk. Okay, running alone, campaigning alone is a risk, okay, going out there. You, you could win, you could lose. But I stand by the mayor. The reason why I stand by the mayor is because I think that we have a proactive mayor, a hands-on mayor. I've seen a lot of progress in the city right now in the, in the 18 months that he has been mayor. But I think two years is too short. I think that putting in a new mayor right now at this juncture pushes us backwards because it was starting all over again. I say we give Mayor Carpenter two more years. I think he needs a city council that's a little bit more uh, proactive along with him. I'm not saying that you, you, you go for everything. I mean, if it's not right, it's not right. But, you know, let's work together. You know, there's something good out of everything. And I think that, you know, he needs, deserves two more years. And I think that you're going to see a lot more progress. If, if what we're seeing right now in the city of Brockton in 18 months, think of what we could see with a full four years under this mayor. Now, if you look at the political scene, even nationally, mm -hmm. there's gridlock. There's yes. different parties. This is a nonpartisan election, but there's different parties 
they don't get along. Sometimes the person who's the CEO, the president, mm -hmm. doesn't get along with Congress, or Congress doesn't get along with the president, depending on your point of view. Correct. There is a divide between the city council and the mayor's office right now. Yes, there is. Is what you're trying to say is that you, having been appointed by him, Mayor Carpenter, the planning board, and, the, and then the zoning board, um, you think that would help the situation to move Brockton forward? I do. I do. And, and, and as far as the bipartisanship, you know, when Governor Baker was running for, uh, for governor, I actually held a, uh, a meeting in my living room with him. And it was amazing how many Republicans came and Democrats sitting in one room and everyone asking the, the governor, you know, almost the same questions. Everyone was of one accord at that point there. And I reached out to the Republicans as well as the Democrats to bring them there. At this level of government for myself, I don't see Republicans and Democrats. I see Brocktonians, okay? And I think that we need to put all the bickering apart as far as that goes and just work for the common goal. You know, it doesn't matter if you're homeless, sleeping in the street, or if you live deep on the west side in one of the biggest mansions in Brockton. Everyone in this city needs representation, okay? And I think that the mayor is actually trying to address all issues. Sometimes I feel... Uh, I, I feel bad for him because it's, it's so much on his plate, but he's doing it. And I see him in the mornings when he goes in sometimes, uh, how early he's there and how late he leaves. Um, I admire that. Now, you went right for Councilor at Large your first election, okay? Yes. Councilor at Large is citywide. It's like running for mayor. You have to run in all 28 precincts, all seven wards. Correct. Um, why'd you go for the gold and not, not try before you were appointed to be mm -hmm. a ward council? Well, at that time, I was living in Ward 6, mm -hmm. and Michelle Duras was the uh, um, ward counselor. She had her foot firmly, you know, in there. And um, not that uh, I was afraid to run against her or whatever, but the thing is, is that I feel that my strong points basically can benefit the whole city, not just the ward. Um, I, know it's a big, I know it's big shoes to fill, but I'm ready for the challenge. I think that I am the man for the challenge. And everyone that actually, uh, there's some people that we have there that are uh, councils at large right now, they started at councils at large and they did a great job. Um, I just feel that, you know, my passion is there, my knowledge is there, and um, I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and do whatever I have to do, you know, to, uh, to fill that role. Now, let me ask you, um, having endorsed the mayor, mm -hmm. do you endorse his policies? Let me tick off a few of the different things. Okay. The power plant that is going to come up during the debate. It is going we're, to come we're, up. we're doing a debate in conjunction with WATD, Correct. and I'm sure that'll be a question. I'm not telling you what the questions right. are, but that is a proverbial question over the years. Yes. Where are you on that? You sit you know, on you sit on the planning board, so you're dealing with that question directly. Yes. You know, two years ago when I ran, I was completely against the power plant. I researched the power plant since then. Um, at that time, there, I thought I had researched, but not enough. But since then, I've researched it very thoroughly. And um, everything that I've come back with, everything that I have come back with from the people that I've talked to and the research that I've done, the power plant is going to burn clean, okay? And it's not about whether it burns clean or it doesn't burn clean or whatever. I, like I said, my research says it's going to burn clean, um, things like that. But this city cannot afford a $68 million lawsuit, okay? Um, and that's where we're heading right now to hold off something that's already been a, basically approved. Okay, so at this point here, why are we beating a, a, a dead horse? Okay, it's something that's coming down the tracks and all we're doing is spending money uh, away trying to delay it. Um, so do I wholeheartedly, uh, I didn't believe in it two years ago. I look at it now as it is a, something that is going to happen in the city of Brockton. We need to all jump on board and get the best, make it beneficial to the city. Okay, I'm not going to pass judgment with any of the candidates. I'm not. I mm -hmm. had to give my opinion when I ran for state rep, mm -hmm. but normally I, I, I keep, you know, I, I let both sides talk. Right. What about the recent casino vote? Where were you on that? I actually am in favor of the casino. Again, I'm pro economic, uh, you know, I'm, I'm for the economics here in, the, uh, in this city. Okay, we have to actually bring in some type of revenue. Okay, how are we going to do it? You know, I think the casino is a good idea. Um, the location of it right next to the high school was my, basically my only 
downside, you know, as far as how I felt about it. However, I've seen the plans, I've seen the drawings and everything, and when you're coming out the gate of uh, Rockton High School, you will not be able to see anything over there by the way they're going to landscape it. Uh, you might be able to see the back side of a parking garage building. Other than that, I'm in favor of the casino. Desal plant. The mayor wants to buy the desal plant. For years, the city has been making payments on the on the desal plant. Mm -hmm. The city council recently stopped the payments on right. the desal plant. Where do you stand on that? That's a tough one. Okay, um, I think that he has a good idea behind it. It would be great if we could actually uh, buy it. It would be great if we could actually use it and sell. Uh, it's another form of revenue. I don't, um, I haven't done enough research on it yet to find out if the 88, is it 88 million dollars that they're looking mm -hmm. to buy for? I haven't did enough research yet to find out what it's worth, okay? Um, the 88 million dollars sounds a little bit too high. You know, I wish it was, I mean personally from my standpoint, I wish it was cut in half. Um, and then if we could actually go ahead with the plan that the mayor does have for it, I mean if we could actually obtain that like for half the price that they're asking or willing to pay for it, I think that I would be okay with that. City Council recently discussed um, a proposition two and a half override. Mm -hmm. Brockton has never passed a two and a half override. They've never had a debt exclusion on the ballot. Mm -hmm. It's to, from what I understand, because it's just kind of hot off the presses in terms of re yesterday. I'm right. trying not to date this so we can air it a few times, but mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, the CFO, John Condon, will not certify the borrowing un uh, unless there's some kind of an action taken in order to get the police department vehicles, the, the, the new voting machines, all the different things that are on that shopping list. You're a taxpayer mm -hmm. in the city, okay, and you want to be a city council. Where do you stand on something like that? Whew, again, another tough question. You know, I'm in favor of the proposition two and a half that the council has right now. Um, we need more police officers on the street, period. How we do it, your guess is as good as mine. But at this point here, because public safety is number one on my agenda, I think that by any means necessary, we need to get more police officers on the street. Okay, and I don't care if we have to float some bonds However we have to do it, prop two and a half, whatever we need to do, we need to get more police on the street. And so I, I stand with them on that. When you, I'm going to go back a minute. When mm -hmm. you talked about Governor Baker sitting in your living room. Yes. Let's say you get elected to the city council. You're mm -hmm. one of 11. There's a mayor. There's this plan B form of government, strong council, weak mayor, mm -hmm. all the discussion you hear about that. Would you pick up the phone and call Governor Baker if you thought either he wasn't doing something right as opposed to Brockton like dealing with our Massasoit Health Sciences You're building saying, or the downtown campus. Would you pick up the phone and call him and say, hey, uh, Governor, remember this is Gary Keith. I, uh, I had you in my living room. What's going on with how you're treating Brockton? Actually, I, I definitely would. And not only would I call Governor Baker, okay, um, the Labor Secretary that he appointed, uh, Ronald Walker, mm -hmm. was actually, he's a lifelong friend of mine. I can go and knock on his door okay, um, and ask to get a message to the, um, to the governor if I need to. Um, but yes, yes, the answer to that question is yes, I would call him if I had to go down to the state house personally. And when he drove into the parking lot, I would do that also. Okay. You know, Brockton first. Now, seven kids, mm -hmm. Brockton school system? All of them. Okay. Counselors deal with, you hear this all the time, the city side mm -hmm. and then the school side. Your role as a counselor at budget time, the mayor prepares the budget, mm -hmm. the council gets it, they can cut it, mm -hmm. they can't add to it, they can't shift it. Right. How do you see the city and the schools in the terms of a role as a counselor? You know, in the role of a counselor, I think we have to put our school system first. Okay. Um, I think that we're a little bit top heavy as far as uh, you know, having assistant headmasters who have assistant headmasters. Mm -hmm. I think there needs to be something done with that. But as far as cutting our budget, no, I wouldn't cut our budget. I mean, uh, our kids are our future, okay? And I think that all ties into our public safety again because our kids need to be educated. They need to, one of the things that I have here on my, uh, as far as the youth programs, 
we need to use some of our resources basically in that budget for job training, creating youth programs that will keep our youth engaged in community, uh, community spirits and sports, um, work and self-worth, self-esteem, also to maintain the quality of, uh, of Brockton. The After Doc program I think is a great program that we have, but I think it needs to be extended. So um, I'm even for the school budget being even a little bit more than what it is now. You know, um, we shouldn't have to go through this laying off of teachers every year, or even the threats of it. How would you pay for it? Well, resources are scarce, so if you're talking about more money, right now the, the two and a half override is a way to get more money. How would you get more money? Well, again, the mayor's on the right track. The casino is going to bring in some revenue. We have the medical marijuana facility that's uh, bringing in about a million dollars a year. Um, the power plant another four million dollars a year. We have to be able to, if we could get this extra revenue and we can hire our police to make the city a little bit safer, we can attract better commercial business. You know, it's all one vicious circle, um, one place off the other. No one's going to come if we don't do something with our public safety. I wouldn't come. The other thing is, is that it's going to alleviate the homeowners from basically floating Brockton right now. Right now, if it wasn't for the homeowners, Brockton will be underwater, and they can't keep doing this. So we need to do something like this. I, and I think it all starts with, like I said, a vicious circle, Mark. It's, it's, our kids have to be educated correctly so they're not, you know, they're off the, you know, they're not out committing crimes. They need to have activities for them. And with that being done, we need to have public safety. Okay, we need to have the economic uh, stimulus that's going to actually stimulate this economy here so we can attract new businesses and get the revenue going, you know. And you'll see Brockton come back to the way it used to be. Now, being a city councilor, you have to prioritize yes. when you get that budget. Where do things like libraries and seniors fit into that equation? You, 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 you basically told me Public mm -hmm. safety is number one. Yes. You also said education is important. Mm -hmm. So where does like a library or a the senior citizen council on aging fall into that well, equation? Public safety, our um, educating our youth, our um, elderly programs is, is my, that's my one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. If I had to prioritize as far as that goes, the library is very important. Okay, um, however, I would not put it up there on the same skills. I mean, public safety is number one. Everyone needs that. Our kids, if we can educate them, they're not out committing crimes, which again ties into the public safety. Again, our elderly, we can actually take care of our elderly. They, be, they have a little bit more time to go out, and they're not, uh, they're not in the house all the time. I mean, all of that feeds together. If we have to shut a couple of libraries uh, down to have one main library or whatever. I mean, yes, we're a, a, a city, okay, but we do have a nice library right down the street here, and um, it is big enough to where we have to use that one, maybe one more that can open, you know, on one side of the city. If I had to cut anything, it would be a little bit in that area there to make sure that we had enough going towards the other three. Well, we'll have that conversation another time, <laughs> because my hat, one of my hats is the library chair. I know. So I'm asking, <laughs> because you have to, I mean, People need to know where you're coming from. Yes. Okay. Um, let me ask this question. In terms of um, being a man of the church, mm -hmm. very proud of it. You've talked about it, and you talked about why you ran and yes. how you got a message. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mayor Carpenter has a proposal to tax non-exempt companies, not churches yet, mm -hmm. but nonprofits. Right. How do you feel about something like that? It depends on what they're doing. I we have a lot of we have a lot of businesses that are listing themselves as nonprofit, and actually they're not. Okay, churches absolutely not. Okay, um, but if you look around, we have a lot of places that are actually hiding under that too. Okay, so that's a little touchy for me. However, I think the mayor has a point. He has a point. Okay, I'm not saying that you go about doing it. That, See, the reason why we have a, a, a lot of people on the council is because somebody can come up with an, a proposal and someone can add or delete to it the same way we do the budget that, you know, uh, the CFO presents. Mayor Carpenter has a point. I'm not saying it's the right point, but it's a starting point. And I think that we can actually 
do something, you know, from that point there, whether we add to it or delete from it, to actually make sure that the city gets its fair share from, you know, those that are really not, those that are hiding under nonprofit status that where we know basically that they're not. You know, um, every storefront can't be a church. You know, I mean, if that's the case, why don't we all just start adding churches into our basements and do the same thing? There you go. Now, let me ask you, you we talked about your slogan that's on the sign we're looking at, yes. Transition for Change. You just told me coming in, you have a new slogan. So what's the new slogan? My new slogan on my new signs is, I am Brockton. And what that basically means is that I can relate. Being a father of, and, a, and a husband of a family of nine, I can relate to everybody that lives within the city of Brockton. I'm fortunate enough right now to make six figures. It wasn't always that way. Okay, there's been times, and even, even now, raising a family of my size, I'm still low income. <laughs> However, I've been homeless. I've been unemployed. I've been in the welfare lines when I needed it, when I was unemployed. I've been on food stamps. I've actually was on my way to work one morning and uh, knowing that I had to put food on the table as the head of a household, turned around and sat in the Charity Guild food pantry, okay, to get a, a couple of bags of groceries, you know, to, to make sure that my family could eat for the next day or two until I got paid. I robbed Peter to pay Paul to pay my bills. I need all 29 days out of the month before I can write a check to pay my bills. And uh, like I said, with all that being said, I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. Brockton is a blue collar town. It will never be a white collar town. And in that aspect, because I've walked in all those different shoes, I think I can relate to everybody that lives within the city of Brockton, which makes me a, Brock a true Brocktonian after over 25 years, which says, I am Brockton. Well, I've never heard that slogan before. Everybody comes up with a, with a different one, and you've got to differentiate yourself. Thirteen candidates for eight slots to mm -hmm. be narrowed to four slots, okay? Correct. What makes you different? Why do you feel you're more qualified? Or you have different things to bring to the table? Well, I think that I, I, I applaud all 13 of the, all the, the 12 other candidates that are running. Um, I ran the first time as an unknown, and I put in the work, okay? I make my planning board meetings, my uh, um, zoning board meetings. I started to see exactly how the inner workings happen here in the city. I've talked to a lot of uh, businesses that are coming into the city um, through those channels. Um, and, and, and at that point there, basically, it gave me a lot more insight as to what's going on. With the passion I have to try to move the city forward, I'm not looking to get into City Hall and basically fight against the other councilors or to, um, you know, just knock things down because, you know, I'm not bigger than Brockton. Okay, I'm here to represent the city of Brockton. And what I think a lot of our councilors have forgotten about that I haven't, which is I think what differentiates me with them is that I know what serving is all about. I serve in my church. I get up early in the morning and I drive into Boston to our Boston location where I was security to the bishop. It's not a paid position. It was something that you do, you know, from your heart. It's something that you believe in and that's what you, you go to do it and you give it your all. Serving the city of Brockton, I'm here to give my all. Okay, it's not about... Uh, getting a, a small stipend is not about anything else. I do it for nothing. The thing is, it's about, it's my turn, coach. Give me the ball. Put me in the game. You know, I sat on the sidelines and I watched what was going on for the past 25 years, and I'm tired of it. You know, give me my shot now to see if I can make a difference within uh, the city hall chambers. Let, give me the opportunity to work with some of the existing councils that we have there and see if I can't get it to be a little bit more cohesiveness, okay, to where we can actually push this, this whole city forward. Because right now, to me, it seems like there's too much bickering and fighting and grandstanding going on, you know, just to, for one person to look better than the other. And that's not what we're here for. We're here to serve, and that's the bottom line. I got the five-minute cue. I want to make sure I leave you a little time for a closing statement. Sure. But I, I, I do want to ask if... All the ward councillors have ward meetings, mm -hmm. or should if they don't. 
You're a counselor at large. Yes. What would you do to communicate with the people? Because there is no hearing of visitors at the city council. You cannot go to the city council and speak. Mm -hmm. You only can go to FinCom if you're invited to appear. Right. Okay? You've got to be on an agenda to talk to the planning board. Mm -hmm. So how would you communicate with your constituents as a counselor at large? First of all, every ward counselor, every uh, ward counselor that does have a, uh, a ward meeting, I would be there to attend each one. I feel as there's only four councillors at large, and I feel that where we are over the whole city in that capacity, I think it's my uh, obligation to actually be at every ward meeting that I can possibly attend to. You know, um, because it shouldn't just be that ward councillor that's trying to find out all the information. I think they stand stronger, okay, when they have an at large councillor uh, with them. And you have both of them there, so we're the ward council is doing one thing, and they know they have the backing of a council at large there. And I think together, they're stronger than one. The way I look at it is I have five representatives. I have my ward council and my four at larges mm -hmm. and the mayor, six right. representatives. There were meetings that have been done over the past year, not this past year, mm -hmm. but with the council, the school committee, my southeastern school committee, myself and Mr. McAllister, mm -hmm. and the mayor. They haven't happened this particular year. Mm -hmm. Is that a good way to communicate? No, it's not. It's not a good way to communicate. The meetings within all of the city government uh, agencies, uh, departments, are very... Uh, we need all of that. This is... We cannot seclude each one. All of it works together. Mm -hmm. And especially when we're talking about... Our budget isn't that big that we're playing with, for one thing. And we really need to be... Uh, of one accord, you know, the school department, uh, the uh, city council, all the boards, all the department heads, we need to know what's going on in every department in order for we can make the city run, fun you know, function correctly. So, Two minutes, Gary Keith, talking to the voters, right, right to them. Well, my name is Gary Keith Sr. Again, I have a lot of love for this city, which is why I'm here. I, I jumped into this race because I feel that I can make a difference not only for myself and my family, which of course my family, everyone's family is number one to them, but if I can make a difference for my family, I can make a difference for your family because again, as I spoke about, it all, it all to me is one big melting pot here in the city of Brockton. We're all one. We have a great city here, okay? We're a city of champions. We've always have been, which is why I moved to this city, which is why we all live here. It can be great once again, but it's gonna take a collaborative effort of everyone doing what they need to do and as long as we have members of our city government that are looking only for their own self-interest, then nothing's ever going to go forward. And I think we are actually running out of time. Okay, when I say running out of time, I mean that we can't continue to let this go the way it has been going. We need to stop it. We need to stop it now. We need to work with the mayor. We need to work with our, our police chief and the police department. We need city council members that I'm always going to say no, but let's say how can we get it done? It's not about the problem. We're look, we need to focus on the solution. And right now, the thing is, is that I feel that the love and the passion that I have in this city, uh, I'm one of the people that can actually help make this happen. Okay? And it's not that, you know, I have all the answers. I'm not the savior. But I'm one piece of the puzzle. And when you're putting a jigsaw puzzle together, you start with that one piece, and then you connect another piece, and eventually you have the picture done. Okay, so collaboratively we can actually bring this city back to where it once was. My name is Gary Keith Senior, number ten on the ballot of this year, and hopefully second time's a charm. Hopefully you can vote me in as your city councilor at large. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Thanks for being on. We'll follow you throughout the campaign, and hopefully we'll have you back. Thank you very much. Okay. Glad to be here. Um, you're watching Democratically Speaking, Mark Lindy, your host. Stay tuned for more candidates as we follow the preliminary election in the city of Brockton and then afterwards and with the special Senate election. Um, m most of all, make sure that you educate yourself on all of these candidates, but most importantly, go out and vote. Thank you.